Hi there, my name is Rappelang Ravana and I'm an entrepreneur in the tech space for the last 15, 16 years perhaps. I am the founder of Rekindle Learning and also a founding partner at Fast Forward Innovation. My first love is digital skills and at Rekindle Learning we use technology, personalized learning, bite-sized learning approach to empower people to you know, perform well in work and adapt to the constant changes in their work environment. And at Fast Forward Innovation, I help companies figure out how to innovate faster and actually execute on their digital transformation ambitions. So last year, Rekindle Learning entered the MTN App of the Year Award and we're very, very happy to have been a finalist or a category winner, as you guys call it. So the Rekindle Learning App is the next generation of e-learning, as I like to think about it. You know, originally e-learning was about putting the content online, making it accessible on a shared drive or a nice um, web page of sorts, etc. And now for us, it's about how do we change the way we interact with content digitally and not just make it accessible online with the view that it has to become more efficient if we're really going to reap the benefits of digital learning. So we've taken a step back. We've recognized that people prefer to learn in bite sizes. All those slides online, everyone skips through anyway. Nobody reads important email memos, whether it's about the organization strategy, its new philosophy or customer experience or products or operational ways of work. Um, everything that a company needs to perform to drive revenue, to reduce costs and improve its you know, customer and employee experience. All of those things really speak to companies' internal know-how or their own you know, IP or way of doing things. And typically, companies haven't had an easy way to package that in a mobile, bite-sized, interactive way. Yes, we have it on your, you know, your Coursera's or your public um, MOOCs and the like, but this is more about internal face and content in a company, which is what you really need to deliver performance. It's got to be the stuff that matches to the executives, to the team every day. And what we do there that uh, I think allowed us to win is personalized learning. So it tracks the stuff you're getting wrong and right, focuses you on your weak areas. Most of the content is either video or interaction, very limited reading because we know people don't like to read and almost becomes your learning coach. So whether you've got a heck of a long compliance module to get through or you are you know, a sales rep in a, in a call center or at a store, at a mobile store, you're able to keep up to date with whatever's happening in the business. You're empowered to actually promote the organization effectively and you know how to do what you're required to do better. And I think for me, that's a big thing when we think about the employability of young people and how they progress in their careers and empowering them with that right in their pocket easy way to learn the same way they consume email and social media is just about what we like to do. I would say that what inspired me to build the Rekindle Learning app has always been a long-term interest in, in mobile anything and learning, given you know, our context as a continent, the huge responsibility and opportunity we have to figure out how to reskill people in a fundamentally different way is what has gotten me into the space. And Rekindle Learning is, is a baby on that journey. I think there's a tremendous amount from you know, personalized microlearning now will want to move into virtual reality and augmenting the knowledge-based learning with, with some experiential learning. And there's a whole world out there to redefine uh, digital learning in a way that is actually far more efficient and more effective than in person, as opposed to trying to replicate or compensate for not being in person. Um, and there's a journey there for the whole industry that I'm keen to stay involved in for the foreseeable future. I got into technology really at university stages. I, I ended up studying a business science, computer science, not by planning, but I had no idea what I wanted to study and that's what my brother recommended. And it was, it was very hard at the time and I definitely wanted to drop it initially. But in the end, I stuck with it because it was one of the only subjects at the time that I felt allowed you to come up with an idea and make it in a reality and exit thought world into real world 
Whereas most of the stuff, I, I think, you know, you were ruminating in, in Thought World for, for a very long time. And I decided also that I, I don't think I can keep playing the corporate system. I was ready to finally decide what I decided was important and decide how I spent my time and what I gave my attention to. It you know, was the most important thing for me coming out of university. And luckily I found a couple of classmates who were also desperate not to get a job and we started Yego. I would say that the number of challenges that you face in a digital business actually are, are pretty common throughout. And there's, you know, some then are just specific to you as a person. But I think in any digital business, the biggest challenge by far at Diego was figuring out how we monetize and get and collect payments. Um, we were, you know, very early in the market. It was before the world of app stores and play stores. People didn't put credit cards on their cell phones to buy stuff with. And figuring out your monetization and secondly, your distribution, how are you really going to find those customers is by far and away the, the actual biggest problem or challenge you will face in a business. I would say that most businesses die because the cost of customer acquisition is so high, they never acquire enough to you know, stay, stay alive. So you actually needed half of the business or maybe even a quarter of the business is the product. Another half to, uh, you know, the rest is distribution and, and go to market. And getting our heads around that as technically trained people was a real mental shift. I would also say, you know, um, the, the funding climate in South Africa and the continent in general is still very immature. It's gotten a lot better. Um, the startups today are raising money left, right and center, which is amazing to see. Very different world from where we were starting from. Um, but we were lucky to get some support along the way. It was certainly, you know, not enough when you compare the peers that we had in, in Europe and then in Israel and the like, they, they were raising 10x, you know, what, what we were able to do for, for similar stage and, and product maturity. So accepting that as a reality and still, you know, willing to refocus and say, okay, if this is not how we can monetize the business, what do we need to do to change? And being, having to accept that you can't execute it the way you may have initially dreamed and being willing to sort of flex and go. And outside of sort of the business, you know, challenges of growth and scale, and there's all the people ones that I haven't even, you know, touched on, I would say that entrepreneurship is also a much bigger personal growth journey. And you've got to be willing to check yourself and challenge yourself and surround yourself with people that make you think twice, people that hold a mirror to you to hold you accountable, to make you ultimately want to perform better. And that better isn't just the better you think you know, it's the better that you're not even aware of. And that journey of self-awareness is, is, is probably the hardest part of entrepreneurship. And I think we often overlook that. The digital adoption rate, I think, in South Africa or anywhere really, I think differs a lot when you look at consumer versus corporate and business markets. Consumer markets have always sort of been leading in, to some extent in the applications they consume. But in fairness, they have often been the much simpler applications, you know, your, your WhatsApp or your social media or, you know, photo sharing kind of things. And I still think personally that the proportion of users consuming a lots of sophisticated apps, whether it's, you know, managing your CRM or your accounting or whatever on your phone, actually making it core to your work, isn't all that frequent beyond email. So I think there's still a journey there. And in terms of corporates, there's a lot of hype and interest. Almost any corporate out there wants an innovation lab or to be working with startups or anything, you know, to that effect. But the reality is that it's not... You can't tackle it as a cute and fluffy thing. If you really want to, if you really want to support the growth of innovation, corporates must also reflect and actually make a decision or figure out how they procure and use uh, services from, from innovative startups and scale-ups on the continent. Too often, it's still a showcase. It's still cute and keep going. Um, let's clap hands. You guys tried, but let's go back to business and procure from, you know, the big international three-letter acronym companies of sorts. There's no, they, in their minds, it's fundamentally different. You, to have something real that is tech and business, 
you go elsewhere, you don't go to your local ecosystem. And that's, that's a big flawed perception, I think. Um, and in addition to that, there's, we need to do a lot in terms of empowering executives or to have the digital comfort or know-how or tech fluency to be willing to make you know, technology-related decisions. For as long as public sector, large corporations believe that technology is in a big box in the cupboard where you hire a top-notch management consultant to tell you what to do, then we're never going to have local consumption. And that'll mean that all the innovations and ideas, you know, languish after an initial launch and we don't get adoption. And all major markets that are, you know, truly digital and consuming local markets buy locally as well. My life journey has been quite interesting. I think I was born in Botswana and uh, spent most of some of my primary school there, school in Johannesburg, and then went to UCT. I had amazing parents who were very clear that whether you've got, whether you're a boy or girl, if you've got, you know, hands or feet and brain, everyone must do maths and science, cook and clean. So I definitely had the benefit of growing up in a platform where I didn't know that I could have limitations or I was supposed to have limitations being a girl. Yes, there were nuances in how you know, boys and girls were treated, but in many ways I perceived it as a personal preferences of other people. I had no idea that it, had, it was f something fundamental to my existence or constraints. And so that, that gave me a leg up. And by the time I went to university, I was also one of those very inquisitive kids that was not so sure that going this pilot mode and just listening to the adults was going to work out for me. I wasn't convinced that I would get to this happy, successful place just coasting, you know, along. And I was clear by the end of university that I needed to find a different way to do life that didn't seem so pointless and, and menial and yeah, something that would make it a lot easier and happier to, to get up in the morning and do stuff. And we heard there's something called entrepreneurship where you get to decide what the business is about. And we thought maybe that's the way. <laughs>